Hi, welcome to Investments Chapter 9 Excel. And as you know, when I go through each of the chapters in my investment lecture series, I stop at certain slides and I go over formulas, but I say I'm going to make an Excel video to show you how you can calculate these in Excel. So these are the equations from Chapter 9 that we're going to be working on today. And these equations were explained in the video. The first one is abnormal returns. And it's a very simple formula. I have the formula up here. And we're just taking the actual returns and minusing the expected returns. And we get the alpha or what is also known as the abnormal returns. Very simple calculation. And then we have the confidence index. So here we're looking at the average yield on 10 high grade corporate bonds and the average yield on 10 intermediate grade bonds. So what we basically do here is we take the high the average on the high yield bonds and we divide it by the average of the intermittent intermediate bonds and we get the confidence index here. So when you're trying to interpret this when the closer the confidence index is to 100 the more confident investors are in the market and when the confidence index is lower like it is here in problem three the less confidence investors have in the market and this has to do with um, how close in yield the high grade bonds are to the intermediate bonds when they're closer in yield then people are more confident about the economy and people are willing to take um, take on less return for the, in the risk of the intermediate bonds. You're so confident that the market, the economy is going to do well, and that's going to translate into these bonds doing well. Okay, so let's move into the trend. So the we're going to take the, the number of stocks that are up on a particular day, divide it by the number of stocks that are down in a particular day as far as their price, and then we're going to divide that by the volume of stocks that are moving up and the volume in stocks moving down. Okay, so it's a pretty simple calculation here, uh, but you have to use your parentheses. So we start out with stocks moving up. We divide that with stocks moving down. Close parentheses, and we're going to divide that by open parentheses. The volume of stock, the the volume of up stocks that are moving higher divided by the volume of stocks moving lower. Close parentheses, and we get this trend number. This shouldn't be expressed as a percentage. So I'm going to change this to uh, just a number. So three. Now, so what does this three represent? Um, it's not so much represent what it represents because it's it's looking at both the number of stocks moving up compared to stocks moving down and then the, the volume on the stocks that move up compared to the volume of stocks move down. This if this say this is you know 400 seems very light. So if we did move this to say 400,000 you're going to see and this is 800,000 since they're relative you see the same results. Whether this is 4 million, 8 million or 40 million, 80 million the uh, trend is still going to show uh, a measure of three. Now, the higher trend values are going to be interpreted as being bad for the market because even though more stocks rose than fell, the the trading volume in the falling stock, the falling stocks, was much greater. So the underlying idea is that a, a strong market is characterized by more stocks rising in price and falling. Uh, along with greater volume in the rising stocks than in the falling ones. So that's what we're basically looking at here. So let's, you know, I could just move this along to calculate these three. So we see this is much lower. So if we look here, the, there's more rising stocks than falling stocks. That's pretty common. But the volume percentage is much higher on the rising stocks than the falling stocks. So that's why this is a lower trend number. Now for problem three, we get a number that's lower than three because we have um, the volume difference is in um, 
the volume percentage between the down stocks and the share the 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 number of stocks that went down um, isn't as significant as in problem two. So it also the stocks that went up compared to their volume here it's more than double here it's less than double. So this is why we have a higher number here. So it's really the higher this number the more the higher the number of course the less attractive the stock market is. So I'm just playing around with these numbers a little bit to see how they change. And um, for the effect, set it back to the original. And you see here that the stocks are down. The volume is four times. So it's very, you know, very heavy selling on the stocks that move down and very light selling the stocks that move up. So it's just combining these two um, technical indicators into one formula. So this could be looked at and you know um, get a better idea of the scope of this. So you really want to see the direction. If you calculate this every day, you want to see the direction this is moving in. And if it's moving in the higher direction day after day, that's showing an overall risky or downward moving market. Okay, so let's move into the MFCR, which is the mutual fund cash position. And this is this is pretty easy. We take the mutual fund cash and we divide it by the total assets in the fund and we get the percentage that is in uh, cash. So the higher the percentage in the cash. So this can be looked at two ways. If it's a low number and it starts to move up and managers are moving more into cash, initially when they first move more into cash, that's a negative to the stock market because the fund man mutual fund managers are holding back their cash or green growing their cash positions and that is going to take money away that could be spent on stocks pushing stock prices up but at a certain point a very high percentage uh, in cash is going to be bullish for the market as th those cash piles will eventually be spent on stocks and pull the market higher so as again this is another you want to look at the direction if the direction is that the, the mutual fund cash keeps growing uh, as a percentage and that's bad for the stock market and once it gets a peak and starts to decline that's usually going to be a positive sign for the stock market okay so let's look at the rsi relative strength index so here's the formula on how to calculate that and so i have four problems here so i have the already calculated the average price uh, on the days that are up so this is the average price change on the days the stock market's up and this the triangle means change so here's the average price on the days down so this is could be done for the market or it could be done for individual stocks so let's calculate the formula so we're going to say equals 100 minus 100 divided by 1 plus Now, so at this point, I need to have the, the same amount of parentheses on the right that I have on the left. So I have one, two, three, so I have to add two more. So they always have to be equal. And I hit enter. So here is the RSI on that. And if we move this lower, get these indexes here. So again, this should not be a percentage. This should be a number, because it should be between one and 100. Now, typically, if you if you go through the lecture, you'll see that variables that go above 70 could show over a stock that's over purchased and RSI is below a 30 could could indicate stocks are oversold. And the idea is you can use this when a RSI and a stock reaches 30 to buy it. And then when RSI equals 70 to sell it, sometimes they also use 80 and 20 on that one scale of zero to 100. But again, it's just a measure to really see if the stock is overbought or oversold. And of course, the chapter lecture in the textbook will explain more about this. OK, so that is my video on explaining the quantitative aspects of chapter nine. One bonus aspect that I'll just add to this video is a moving average. So if we have. So I'll just add this in here, just go down here where it's blank. So we could have, uh, it talks about, the ch chapter talks about moving averages as far as plotting them on a chart. So I just wanted to show you 
say we had a 10 day moving average and we just put some information in here. Okay, so it's really just finding the average of these 10 days. But the but where the concept's going to grow on you a little bit more is let me just for here's the 10 day moving average on the 10th day. So if we go to days beyond the 10th day, let's put some more numbers here. Okay. So now the next calculation would be the average again, but now we're going from two to 11 to calculate the 10 day average. So we kind of take away day, day one and we add in day 11. So I wonder if, yes, if I can just pull this down, <clears throat> it just does the same thing automatically. So on day 14, we would be going from our average again, We're only picking up 10 days. Yep, okay. So how this works is, again, it's a moving average. So this is 10 days from day one to 10. This is 10 days from day two to 11. This is 10 days from days three to 12. So all these averages are just the most current 10 days. And then you could take these and you can plot these on uh, a chart. And that would give you a smoothing effect. And the moving averages are something that you, you would use to plot to help you with technical analysis. analysis. So I just wanted to quickly just add in the moving average if you're wondering how those were calculated. Okay, so that's it for chapter nine. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll be talking to you soon. Take care.